to sprout or not to sprout? That is the question. Hey y'all, welcome back to Grains and Grit. My name is Felicia and today we're going to be tackling quite a big topic. We're going to be talking all about whether we should be soaking or sprouting our grains. What is phytic acid? Why do we hear that it's bad? And I will discuss how you can sprout your grains if you choose to do so. Feel free to take notes because this is gonna be quite a big subject. You may even wanna watch this video over again. It's going to be a lot of information, but I am really hoping that I'm able to break this down for you in an easy to understand, but again, it is just, it is just a lot of information, science-y stuff, but hopefully I will be able to make it easy to understand. Now, I feel like there are a lot of people out there that are really confused about bread in general. First of all, we are told that bread is this evil poison, um, that it's a horrible thing, we should be consuming it at all. That's thanks to books like Wheat Belly, Brain Grain, all of those things. If you can get past that hurdle and think that bread is not gonna kill you, you can then find out that the flour in the store is actually different um, than what you can actually mill at home, that there's this thing called milling your wheat at home. Once you get past that hurdle, then you're told, oh, you should be sprouting or soaking your grains. Never ever consume unfermented or unsoaked grains. Confusing really confusing no wonder people just completely give up on this whole thing um, because they're just they're just confused and then sprouting and soaking oh my gosh that just seems like so much work i mean milling your own grain sounds like a lot of work even though it's not but it sounds like a lot of work and then to add on even more steps for people it just makes it so complicated so what do we do what does the science actually say? So I already have videos out there dealing with the myths surrounding books like Wheat Belly. I'll link that up here. I also have videos like how to start milling your grains if you're new to that as well, including how to store them. My last week video was all about why you should be stocking up on grains. So I will link those videos up here if possible. Also down below, feel free to check out my channel for those videos wonderful informational videos, but today we're gonna to be tackling all about whether we should be soaking or sprouting our grains, phytic acid, is it actually a horrible thing to consume? Before we dive in on this channel, I teach you all about healthy whole grains and how to feed your family with them, how to start milling your grains, how to start stocking up on your grains, all things whole grains. If that sounds like something you are interested in, be sure to hit that subscribe button below also, as I announced last week, I have a brand new website out, grainsandgrit.com. Again, link below. Go there, sign up for my newsletter so that I can share with you all the tips and tricks and announcements before everyone else gets them, all of those things. So again, subscribe below, hit that like button, and check out my website, grainsandgrit.com. Okay, so a lot of information has been put out there about sprouting or soaking your grains. The problem that I have found when researching this for myself is that a lot of times the reason that the people out there say that we should be soaking or sprouting our grains is either not factual, not logical, or there's actually no hardcore evidence behind it that, again, that I have researched. Feel free to comment below with whatever evidence that you have found, I will certainly engage with you in the comments below. And if I am wrong, by all means, please tell me. Based on the ton of research that I have done, I have come to the conclusion that we do not have to soak or sprout our grains all the time, but there is a place and time for it. And we will discuss that later. But first, question of the day. Do you already sprout or soak your grains? If so, why do you do it? Comment below, I would love to hear it from you. First off, let's start with the reasons people say that we should always sprout or soak our grains and why their logic that I've seen is actually a bit faulty. Now there are two main predominant arguments that can definitely be broken down of why we need to be soaking and sprouting our, sprouting our grains. Let me know if these sound familiar to you. 
One, our ancestors did it. They were very wise, so we should be doing it too. And number two, the biggest one is we should soak or sprout because it's easier to digest grains. There is phytic acid in grains. It is an anti-nutrient that is going to take good vital nutrients away from your body, which is a horrible thing. And in order to combat that, we need to soak or grain, which neutralizes the phytic acid so that we can absorb and digest grains better. From what I've seen, that reason is always thrown out there, but never actually discussed thoroughly. But lucky for you, we're gonna do that today. Now, first off, let's tackle the easy one. Reason number one that we should be soaking or sprouting our grains is because our ancestors did it. It's how it's been done in the past. They were all knowing and wise and we should do it too. Okay, so this is a yes and no question. Were our ancestors wise people? Uh, yeah, because they survived without you know, refrigeration and electricity. They had to learn to preserve their food, make it healthy and nutritious for themselves to survive without all of our modern conveniences. So kudos to you, my friends. <laughs> we obviously know that they did make some type of sourdough type bread. I mean, we see this in the Bible. The Bible talks about leaven which we know is yeast. Um, commercial yeast did not come about until the late 1800s. So logically speaking, we know that they would make their own starter or leaven, which is how we know it today. Sourdough starters, you just soak some flour with some water and it captures the yeast from the air. Voila, you have your sourdough starter. That's all the, the yeast that you need to make bread. Now, let's stop right here and talk about sourdough for a bit. We're gonna break it down exactly how it is. Generally speaking, we're told sourdough is healthier because it has been fermented and soaked and so it's wonderful for you. While I do agree that with sourdough type breads, it does contain more strands of yeast than what commercial yeast contains. That's not a bad thing. The reason why commercial yeast even came about is because it's a more stable yeast and bakers can now have a reliable source of yeast in order to have a consistent bread all the time. If your living is made from baking bread, it's really beneficial to have a good consistent yeast. So the commercial yeast is not bad, it's yeast. It's usually one or two strands of yeast compared to all of it, but it is still yeast and it's just easier to work with. Here, here's the thing with sourdough is the entire bread, all the flour is not soaked or even sprouted. From what I've seen, no one talks about the fact that people used to sprout their grains, dry them, then mill them, and then make a starter and then make bread. We, we don't really see that. Generally what you're told is how to make a sourdough starter. You get some flour. Um, you know, two tablespoons flour, two tablespoons water, mix it up, you let it sit there 24 hours, you add some more until you get a nice starter and it captured those yeast from the air. Not all the flour is soaked in order to make sourdough bread. Eventually, usually you usually get the starter, you then put, take some of that out, you put it in a little bit of more flour um, to make a sponge. Many recipes you've heard of that where it makes a sponge. Um, that's a little bit more flour and you let that soak overnight and then the next day or whenever you incorporate that with more flour, knead your bread, let it rise, bake. That's it. So even with that, not all of the flour has been soaked. And again, I don't think our ancestors, and I've seen no evidence where they go through this entire long process. I mean, bread baking alone would have been a long process for them. Many of them probably milled I mean, they did mill their grains by hand or they had a millstone. I mean, you're, it's a very manual labor. Why add more steps to it that are not necessary? Also, I'm pretty sure that our ancestors had no idea what phytic acid was and thought, hey, we should neutralize this so that we can live. <laughs> pretty sure they didn't know about it. Again, I do hope that this makes sense. It's a lot of information, kind of complicated, but the bottom line is with sourdough, it's only a small part of it that it's actually been soaked. 
and no evidence that I've seen where they sprouted the grains before making all of the flour that then to then make their sourdough. Now, another point to make with our ancestors is we know that this was not the only way they consumed their grains. They did not just make sourdough bread and consume it. And again, we have the Bible for this. In the Bible, it does talk about many instances where they made cakes. And obviously we talk about unleavened bread, especially come time for Passover. In Genesis 18:6, it states, and Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it and make cakes upon the hearth. So we know that this was obviously a quick bread, no time where we're throwing in that flour, we're gonna soak it for overnight knead it and then make cakes. This was obviously a quick bread. So they did not just soak all their flour and everything like that. And again, no evidence that I've seen where they had it readily sprouted and dried and then mill it into flour. Again, no evidence that they sprouted their grains first, then dried and then milled and then made all of their bread products with just that sprouted flour. Again, if you're doing all of this by hand, you're milling it by hand or whatever, why would you add that extra step? Wouldn't it be way more convenient to just go to your grain storage where your dried grains are? Because again, you cannot store wet grains, more about that later, but you pull your dried grains, you immediately just grind them into whatever flour that you need and then make your bread. That kind of makes the most sense in my opinion. Also, have you ever gotten your hands on an old cookbook? And I mean old cookbook. I actually have one here. <laughs> this I was given to you by my great grandmother who passed away when she was 98 years old. You can't even, I don't even know if it ever said anything on the front, but opening it up, I mean, it's falling apart. It's, I am so excited to have this, but it's the handy cookbook of valuable recipes edited by the ladies of All Saints Episcopal Church, Northfield, Minnesota, December, 1906 second edition so very old book and they have a section in here i mean it's falling apart about bread now little history is the steel rolling mills came out in the late 1800s that's what really revolutionized the bread industry the flour in particular to really strip that bran and germ out of the flour to make white flour though that was available in the late 1800s before then everyone had their local miller generally that they would use especially in the united states that they would go down mill their flour bring it back home it still contained all the brain and the germ again a lot of history but 1906 grant i'm pretty sure most of these recipes were already pretty old as it was white flour was not as available to the masses until about the 1920s this cookbook is from 1906 Nothing in here talks about the need that you must sprout your grains or that you must soak your flour for a long period of time. Now they do have in here where you make a sponge like the night before. So you have a leaven or some yeast. Again, commercial yeast came out late 1800s. So you do have a type of yeast, you make a sponge and then you can use that for your bread the next day. But an overnight soak, not the whole flour. They do talk about sifting your flour for cakes and cookies and stuff. But nothing in there about actually sprouting the grains, drying them, milling them, making your baked goods. I mean, if that was so important, they at least weren't doing it here. Another way that this is kind of faulty logic that all our ancestors did it and that was the wise thing to do and we should do it too, is our ancestors also fermented things for preservation's sake. So they would ferment cabbage to make sauerkraut. They would make yogurt out of milk. Is that the only way that we should be consuming cabbage or milk? I, I would think we would say no. <laughs> That's, that doesn't make raw cabbage horrible for you. On the contrary, they generally state that raw vegetables are great. Same thing with milk. If it's raw milk, that's not bad. That's, that's good to have. Yogurt is also good to have. They still contain the good bacteria. So you see, that's, that's where it gets a little bit faulty with their logic is because our ancestors did it, we should do it. Well, they did a lot of things. That doesn't mean it's the only way to consume. Sourdough was not bad. Sprouting or soaking is not necessarily bad, but it's not the only way that we have to consume our grains all the time. 
I hope this is making sense. I'm also pretty confident that our ancestors had no clue what phytic acid was and said, hey, uh, you know, we should really soak these grains because we're having this anti-nutrient in our bodies to get all these things out that we don't want. And so we should soak and sprout and make more work for ourselves for this. Pretty sure they had no idea. And they were logical people. The reason why you typically see where they would soak things like oats or even wheat berries overnight is because they took a long time to cook. And if you're cooking over an open fire, you're gonna wanna cut down that process a bit. So a lot of times when these, we see that they soak their foods overnight, it was so they would cook faster. It's why we still soak our dry beans, so they cook faster. Um, it's, just, it's just easier. Our ancestors were logical people trying to make life a bit easier for themselves. Part B of this argument on proof that they did sprout their grains is so faulty. It is, it is honestly baffling for me. Now, if you view on my website, I have two books that I highly recommend. They are wonderful. One is Nourishing Traditions by Sally Fallon. The other is The Maker's Diet by Jordan Rubin. I'm a huge fan of the West A. Price Foundation. I think they have so much good information, except when it comes to this. Their logic, at least in here, is not only wrong, but very, very faulty. Again, I am, I'm shocked that they have not seen through this because again, I agree with pretty much everything else. So I do not have a copy of The Maker's Diet, but in The Maker's Diet, they talk about this. I do have the quote from it, page 139. Now they do actually cite Dr. Edward Howell and they quote him, both Sally Fallon and Jordan Rubin. And here's what they say, quote, Dr. Howell noticed that the old harvesting techniques helped preserve and enhance the nutrition value of the grain. After cutting the mature grains in the field, farmers would gather the stalks and loosely bind them upright in sheaves and let them stand overnight in the field before threshing them or removing the grain from the grass stalks the next day. This allowed the grains to germinate or sprout. Now, y'all, <laughs> no offense to Sally Fallon and Jordan Rubin or or Dr. Howell, but this is completely wrong. You can even see this in Farmer Boy. The Little House on the Prairie series in Farmer Boy, they specifically talk about the reason why they stand the grains up and they shock them. That's what they call them, the shock them is so they won't get wet. Because if the grain gets wet and it sprouts, you cannot store it at all. It's gonna go bad very fast. We know the story of Joseph. He stored up grains for the seven year famine. I guarantee you they were dried. They would not have lasted. They would have spoiled within probably a week because once that grain sprouts, you better plant it or consume it in some way because it's gonna go bad very fast. So again, I'm just, <laughs> I'm baffled that they even said this because that's just simply not true. You cannot store grains if they have become wet. They sprout, plant them, or consume them, but you cannot store them for the long haul. They would not have even made it through the winter. In the Bible, in 1 Samuel 12, 17, and Proverbs 26, 1, it talks about how Grain getting wet is a curse. God's gonna send the rain. Isn't it wheat harvest today? That's a bad thing, y'all. That is a bad, bad, bad thing. You do not wanna harvest your grains when it's raining. You wanna harvest them and get them inside or under safety somehow where they're not gonna get wet. So again, this is the only thing that I've ever seen to state that our ancestors sprouted the grains before storing them. And I just know, just, just science, I, I know this for a fact, this is just completely wrong and false. So from all my research, it is safe to say, one, our ancestors and farmers today harvest the grain and do not allow them to get wet so that they can store them. Again, if they get wet, they will not store. Two, no evidence that I've seen shows that all grains must always be soaked every single time that you consume them. Even when it comes to natural sourdough breads, we know that that's not all that was consumed by our ancestors. And just remember that just because our ancestors did it a certain way does not mean we have to do that all the time today. Again, we do not have to 
ferment our cabbage into sauerkraut or we must only consume yogurt, a fermented milk product from milk. We can consume raw cabbage, we can consume raw milk, and we're gonna be just fine. A lot of that was preservation methods. And while a lot of nutrients and lactobacteria is released and is good for our gut health, it is not the only way to consume it. Moving on, the big topic, phytic acid. Is it good? Is it bad? Do we need it? Or do we need to get rid of it at all costs? This is the biggest argument that I've seen people talk about when um, I say that I mill, mill my own grains, make my own bread, and they say, oh, is it a sourdough? Or do you soak or sprout your grains? Because that's what you need to make it digest better or to break down the phytic acid, which is an anti-nutrient. You hear that a lot, but have you ever really dived down into the science behind it? Because that's what we're gonna do. Again, grab a pen and paper. You may need to watch this over again because it's a lot of big information that I'm gonna try and make it easier for you to understand. So to quote from Nourishing Traditions, this is what they say about phytic acid. All grains contain phytic acid. This is page 452, Nourishing Traditions. All grains contain phytic acid, an organic acid in which phosphorus is bound in the outer layer or bran. Remember that part, it's in the bran. Untreated phytic acid can combine with calcium, magnesium, copper, iron, and especially zinc in the intestinal tract and block their absorption. This is why a diet in high unfermented whole grains may lead to serious mineral deficiencies and bone loss. The modern misguided practice of consuming large amounts of unprocessed bran often improves colon transit time at first, meaning you're not constipated. <laughs> but may lead to irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, and in long-term, many other adverse effects. Soaking allows enzymes, lactobacilli, and other helpful organisms to break down and neutralize phytic acid. As little as seven hours of soaking in warm water will neutralize a large portion, a large portion of phytic acid in grains. The simple practice of soaking cracked or rolled cereal grains overnight will vastly improve the nutritional benefits. Okay. So we're gonna dive into this. <laughs> There's a lot here. I'm gonna be referring to my notes a lot. So we're told phytic acid binds with important nutrients, magnesium, copper, iron, um, zinc. It's gonna bind to it, it's a, that's a chelator, and take it out of your body. You need those nutrients, so you need to get rid of the phytic acid because it's gonna take all those nutrients, you're gonna have bone loss, all the nutritional deficiencies that relate to that and because they're taking the calcium, you're gonna have bone loss, um, and that this can also cause irritable bowel syndrome, heretofore referred to as IBS. <laughs> they also say because it breaks down the protein, i.e. gluten and other proteins, that it is easier to digest. Sound scary? <laughs> Are you freaked out yet? Let's actually dive down deeper and look at the science behind this. First of all, is phytic acid bad? What does it actually do? Does it really strip all of these good nutrients? Because I agree, calcium, iron, magnesium, those are important to have. Now here I am heavily going to cite a wonderful article that Sue Becker has done from Bread Beckers. Sue Becker has her degree from the University of Georgia in food science. She's also been pursuing studies on her own for over 20 years now. Her and her husband own Bread Beckers up in Georgia. They're a co-op that sells whole grains, all the things linked below. <laughs> and um, she goes around speaking of this. She is what got us to milling our own grains. And so she has so many personal testimonies from people telling them of the benefits that they've had consuming healthy whole grains unsprouted or unsoaked, plus a lot of research that she's compiled into an essay that I'm gonna be citing. Again, link down below. It's also my web website under resources. Feel free to read it yourself, but I'm gonna try and grab some information and break it down for you. Now in her article, Phytic Acid, Friend or Foe, she cites a book um, called Diet for the Atomic Age by Sarah Shannon, which I've tried to get my hands on. It's kind of difficult to find. One day I, I will do it and read it for myself, but it's very interesting what they were getting from this book. According to this book, Phytic Acid is a chelator. It does have chelating abilities. And while many people were saying this is bad, we are actually living in an age now where we are exposed to tons and tons of heavy metals, toxicity, radiation, 
um, the EMFs that we have, all of those things. And Sarah Shannon, the author, who is not a Bible-believing Christian, does I don't think so at least, does not tout, um, you know, you got to be milling your own grains. Like she's not, she's not that, that type of person. Um, she even says that healthy whole, whole grains intact, the best thing to consume in order to help combat all of this, all of this toxicity that our bodies are exposed to on a daily basis in our modern age. What phytic acid does is it creates phytase in our small intestines and phytates bind with, I'm going to be reading this, with radioactive and toxic substances and carries them out of the body. In fact, supplement companies are now making supplements with this quote, powerful antioxidant because of its anti-tumor, anti-carcinogenic, and blood sugar relating properties. And I have to tell you a story about this because years ago, before my husband and I were even married, um, he does have some blood sugar issues, not diabetic or anything. Um, and he was told by basically Bill Sardi that he should be taking IP6, which is rice bran extract in order to help regulate his blood sugar. Um, a huge reason for his argument was because we consume more iron these days, thanks to all the enrichment in our foods that can mess with your blood sugar and IP6, the bran, remember the phytic acid is in the bran of grains, helps to bind with extra iron and get it out of your body. I found that very interesting, or you could just have brown rice, the grains whole and intact with the bran. I find it interesting that they're putting that in supplements in order to help combat blood sugar issues and those type of things. Studies also show that the phytase that is produced in the small intestine after consuming phytic acid actually increases, not decreases, the absorption of minerals, especially calcium. So again, phytic acid is a chelator, but it produces phytate in your small intestine and that phytase, I think I said phytate, that phytase actually helps absorb the nutrients, not what you generally hear. And I'm gonna quote this again. Other studies have shown that the increase of phytase activity offered significant reduction in the formation of cancer cells in the colon, which if you don't know, colon cancer is actually the number two killer in this country. I wonder why that is. It states this anti-carcinogenic protection was also attributed to phytic acids, mineral chelating, properties. Y'all, it is anti-cancer. And I think this is why Sue Becker especially talks about so many testimonies and what I've experienced myself, um, consuming whole grains. Again, I mill my own grains at home. I do not soak them. I do not sprout them. I don't really even do sourdough a lot. But in doing that, um, people have helped their digestion so much, especially dealing with constipation because of all that fiber. Um, she talks about people healing their ulcerative colitis, their diverticulitis, all these itises, <laughs> um, because of the whole grains, they actually help you. Another thing phytic acid does is it releases inositol, inositol, I-N-O-S-I-T-O-L. <laughs> which is a key B vitamin necessary for metabolizing fat and cholesterol, which again, she really talks about people who have started milling their own grains at home. You're now consuming healthy whole grains, their cholesterol drops. That's actually due to the phytic acid. That's a good thing. So you see, there's a ton of misinformation out there, a lot of confusing thing about phytic acid, and I really hope I have not lost you. I really encourage you to go read her article, Phytic Acid, Friend or Foe, again, linked below and on my website, and do this research for yourself. It was just so much information that I'm trying to break down for you guys so you can easily understand it. Another note is phytic acid, I know it sounds horrible, it's a chelator, mm, chelator. Have you ever heard of oxalic? acid, O-X-A-L-I-C, oxalic acid. Have you ever heard of that? That's a key later as well. You know where it's found? It's found in spinach, chard, rhubarb, cranberries, almonds, and other vegetables. And it's a key later as well, which means it's binding to metal, getting it out of your body. Yet no one's freaking out and saying not to consume rhubarb or cranberries or your almonds. 
as a cherry on top. As I read earlier, Sally Fallon Slate stated that the majority of phytic acid is neutralized being soaked overnight. Do you wanna know how much is actually neutralized? In an overnight soak, 10%. 10% y'all, um, you know, I've done some math and then 10% is not the majority out of 100. I'm just saying. So it's not even the majority that is taken out. Only 10% of phytic acid is even neutralized in an overnight soak. Also, fermenting grains does not necessarily make it automatically nutritious. Um, a study done, and again, she cites this in her article, um, the, and all the citation and all the citations are there. But a study was done on the fermented bread on the fermented African cornbread OG or OG, however you pronounce it that so much protein and calcium was broken down that it was actually not nutritious at all. It didn't even fatten up rats. So just because it's broken down and fermented doesn't always make it the best nutritious food. As a Bible believing Christian, I find it very interesting that bread is constantly being attacked nowadays. Wheat constantly being attacked. Jesus himself compared himself to bread. He said, I am the bread of life. And yet so many people are attacking bread. Why would they trust in the real bread of life if they are constantly being told that bread is a poison? It's a kind of a subconscious thing that I think is being put in people's brains. Something interesting to think about. Now moving on to how to soak your grains and when it might be appropriate to do so. If you have seen my video, why you should be stocking up on grains linked up here, I do mention that there is a time to be sprouting your grains because it does significantly increase your vitamin A and your vitamin C, two nutrients that are slightly deficient in wheat. It skyrockets your vitamin A by 300% and your vitamin C by 500%. So that is an absolutely wonderful time to sprout your grains to increase that nutrient content. It also does break down some of the protein. So those who have issues digesting gluten, a sprouted grain might actually be easier for them. However, I actually suggest try milling your grains first. If you have issues with gluten because you're eating bread from the store, absolutely that is not great to have. I can understand why you would have issues. I would first recommend try milling your grains first, consuming that, see if you still have issues. If you do, then possibly sprouting, or a lot of times we have issues digesting things because we are just unhealthy. Consume a lot of probiotics, get your gut bacteria up and going, make sure it's really, really good and healthy, and that is what helps your digestion. Just a few tips. Now, I used to soak my grains whenever I first found this out, thinking it would be easier to consume. It was a long process. How I would do it is I would have a mason jar. I would only do a quart, this is a half gallon. A quart size mason jars, put the wheat berries in. I would then fill it up with water. And then I actually found some screen materials. So what you use for screens on your windows and your doors. I went to a hardware store. I was able to get a small roll of that. I cut a little bit out. I put, on the, I put it on top, put a rubber band um, on it. So I put a rubber band on it. So I'd fill it up with water and then turn it upside down. <laughs> and let all the, water, all the water run out, do this, and then put it over a bowl because some more water's going to run out, and I let it sit there overnight. And usually by the next day, I would see little teeny tiny sprouts on my wheat berries. Boom, you're done. Now you gotta dry it. I, some people say to put it in the oven. I never would do that because when I did do that, I would typically actually cook the grain and I didn't wanna do that. I would actually put it in my dehydrator now again, what I had to do with the one that I have is I had to still take that screen material, cut it out to where it fit my trays so the wheat berries wouldn't fall through but yet still get the air circulation. And then I would put it around the dehydrator, let it dehydrate usually in, for the whole day. The key is have it completely dry. Do not put wet grains in your grain mill because you will clog it and if you've seen my Wonder Mill troubleshooting video, I have done that and it's a pain in the butt to try to unclog it. So you need to make sure that it's completely dry before you mill it. Otherwise, you're gonna clog your mill and, and that's just it's just not gonna be pretty or fun. 
Again, you can sprout it and then soak it and then make like a gruel with wheat or like, a, you know, think oatmeal type thing, a mush. Um, you can do that. You don't have to grind it. So there are ways to consume it. But it was a very long process. I'm pretty sure that the majority of the vitamin E was already oxidated out because in just three days, 90% of the vitamin E is, is lost to oxidation. So I'm losing a lot of nutrients. Again, in a grid down situation, if I need my vitamin A and C, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna consume it. I'll probably just eat it more in a gruel type situation to try and consume it as quickly as possible so I'm not losing other nutrients like vitamin A. But that is something that you can do. There we go, we made it. Tons and tons of information. Again, I hope this makes sense for you. Please comment below with any questions that you may have. Read the articles that I've cited. Again, I leave them on my website. I'll link them down below as well. In conclusion, there is a time to sprout and soak your grains, but I do not think it needs to be all the time. And phytic acid isn't the bad guy that you think it is. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next week. Have a wonderful day.